Apologize for being a little late. Uh, it's the one place you have to pay to come to work. It's crazy. So I buy a parking pass and then I can't find parking. <laughs> yeah, they charge us to come to work. So you guys have a lot more to complain about. So I'm right there with you some days, like today. Okay. What happens to a frog's car when it breaks down? It croaks. I like that. It gets towed away. All right. Why did the witch's team lose the baseball game? Why did the witch's team lose the baseball game? The bat flew away. Did you hear about the kidnapping at school? I know. It's okay. He woke up. <laughs> So we're in neurological diseases. I've made a couple of updates to PowerPoints. You'll see those today. Uh, just because I spent a little time, I was driving around finding a parking spot, modifying the slides. I had so much time. It was amazing. Um, but uh, I think this is a pretty interesting unit. Uh, it, we have a lot of interesting units, but I, I think this one is, is pretty fascinating. It's probably one of the units, this one in cancer, probably one of the ones that I know the least about, to be quite honest. Those are two fields that are like ridiculously complicated. Neurological disease, because we're dealing with the brain, and then cancer, cancer biology. Okay? Um, not that the other fields aren't complicated, but uh, there's so much information in these spaces. So, you know. What's neat about it is I get to introduce it, and I'm cherry picking some of the stuff that I think is most interesting, clearly. Right? I want to have a great lecture. Somebody have a mountain bike accident? Yeah? Yeah, I got you right here. We'll have to share a battle group. Yeah. Oh, yeah, you got one too? Yeah, it's all you know. It doesn't look very good. You guys want to see it? Yeah. yeah. No, it's, uh, you guys need to tell me if it's resolution or uh, repair. You ready? <laughs> I got other scars, but this is the only one I'm going to show you. Oh, yeah, it's pretty nasty, huh? Yeah. How's yours? Is it still like, seeping? This is yesterday, so yeah. Ooh, yeah. That's, that's we won't let you take that off. Yeah, that's pretty gross. Yeah. <laughs> Keep my helmet to yourself. <laughs> um, so, neurological, now I can't get this one button. You guys know what I'm talking about, this is one button. I that's what you have kids for, because they have little fingers. Like, hey, get over here. <laughs> like, oh, I got it. Like, All right, it's the other way. It's really hard, because that's the left hand. So therapeutically, what we need to do is we need to back up <coughs> two slides. OK? Because we hit the pause button on, um, on Monday, and we were talking about transient ischemic attacks. And with transient ischemic, atta transient ischemic attacks, TIAs, they're predicted for stroke. So if somebody has a transient ischemic attack and they come in, they present maybe with speech impairment, um, they got a little dizzy, they uh, were disoriented, they kind of act like maybe they had a concussion but they never hit their head. And uh, we're gonna talk about concussions today. Um, so with these TIAs, we're gonna take imaging, we're gonna get these pictures. And we're going to skip forward, not this slide, because this is post-mortem. We're going to try to prevent this slide from showing up. We're actually going to try to treat. And the way that we're going to try to treat is we're going to use a variety of therapies that are either pharmaceutical, that means drugs, <coughs> or they're, nowadays they're endovascular repairs. So with pharmaceutical treatment, we'll prescribe medications that typically are going to prevent coagulation. They mean... Uh, antithrombotics or antiplatelets, they'll block the activity of the platelets. That's the pharmaceutical therapy. So actually one of the most common over-the-counters is aspirin, okay? And aspirin has some really amazing antiplatelet activity. Um, Bayer was the organization that first brought it to market 
way back in the 1800s. And if it was to go to market today, it probably would never get approval. And you could buy it over the counter of a drugstore. But the reason you wouldn't get approval today is there are so many side effects and so many routes of activity of aspirin. It's literally kind of like a miracle drug. Okay? But a little aspirin every day in a patient will help to prevent a lot of coagulation from occurring in these vessels that are compromised, the ones that narrow down because they have disease and they have a smaller lumen. Well, there are some more sophisticated medications other than 1800s aspirin. Um, so we've got other ones on the market like Plavix or um, we've got Persanti. And these are the trade names of these drugs, but you can Google them. So patients will be prescribed Plavix if they've got uh, TIAs and you're worried about small vascular disease like you see in the upper right hand corner where we've got this image on fluoroscopy which is just a fancy word for x-ray where we've injected this radiopaque dye it's perfusing the common carotid vessel and here's the bifurcations the internal the external and you can see that this is narrowed down and so this one I mean the drugs aren't going to open it back up but if it's Compromise, maybe not quite to that extent, the drugs would keep the blood from coagulating and forming a thrombotic lesion in that location. Okay. So that's pharmaceutical therapy. And, and the idea is you can kind of see the, the area of the uh, uh, bisection that's shown here. Here's a normal pairing of our internal and external carotid just after, just, just distal to the bifurcation. You can see the normal vessel nice and patent. You see the yellow lines are transcribing you know what would be wide open and you can see the lining of this internal carotid that is narrowed and here's our lesion and the yellow is highlighting you know it's like a 98 percent blockage and so if we look under fluoroscopy that would correspond to this type of image now what we can do endovascular in the old days we'd actually fillet open the neck we would expose the carotid vessel you would actually cut out the disease segment, and then you would physically sew in a replacement blood vessel. And a vascular surgeon would do this work, okay? Now we've gotten a look, and you have a nice wound, okay? It would be on your neck. And so if you see 78 year old patients that have old <laughs> carotid surgical repair, okay? An endarectomy would be the name of the, the procedure. They're gonna have a scar on their neck, and those patients are pretty old. I mean, they're gonna be in their 80s. Because I would say maybe a decade to two decades ago, endovascular repair, which is what we're gonna talk about here in a second, came on the scene and started taking over, and you're gonna see why. What we can do is we can come in with a wire, okay, literally almost like a coat hanger, but it's very, very floppy, and you access it from a federal <coughs> artery, or you can access it from a, um, uh, a vessel in the arm. Usually it come in from the left side um, because of the access into uh, the vessel. If you need to go up the right side, you might come over from the right side, but um, usually it's the left side. You, you fish this, this wire, this, it's called a guide wire, and you feed it through the blood vessel. And how do you know where you are? Well, the guide wire, is radio opaque, meaning under x-ray, you can see the wire advance. So you can know exactly where it is in the neck, okay, or in the, the coronary circulation, similar procedure, and you push it through the lesion. Then you advance a device over top of the wire, and you deploy it. It opens up, you bring out the catheter, after the de device is deployed, and you leave behind, in this case, this is showing a stent. Now there's a different, different types of stents. There's self-expanding stents, which is what I just described. You deploy it, and it opens and stays in place. There are balloon expandable stents, where you inflate a balloon, it pushes the stent open, then you deflate the balloon, the stent stays open, and then you pull the balloon out, okay? You inflate the balloon with saline, usually mixed with a radio opaque contrast agent. You never inflate with air. Why would you not inflate a balloon with air in the vasculature? What's that? If it ruptures, then you have an embolism into the heart, right? You'd be surprised how many medical students don't understand that. So you're, you're way ahead. I'm, I'm actually dead serious. 
There are actually lawsuits with residents that have inflated these balloons with air and not with saline. Yeah, some of you are shaking your head like, <coughs> if that's one of your colleagues in the future, just slap them, okay? Um, so balloon expandable stents, self-expanding stents. These stents are wide open mesh, and so now we make drug cover or drug eluding stents. And we'll put drugs on there. You would think that they would be like a Plavix, like an antiplatelet. Actually, what we put on there are antiproliferative agents because what we're trying to do is the lumen of the vessel where that disease is, this area right here is highly proliferative. And so what you want to do is you want to slow down proliferation for what's called restenosis, where it closes back again. Okay, so we coat these drug eluting stents now with anti-proliferative agents. An example would be paclitaxel. That's the name of an anti-proliferative. Slows down proliferation. Um, and then the last version are um, covered stents, or stent grafts is what we call them. And so stent grafts is, you actually have a fabric that this stent is included with. And so the reason you would do that is for like an aneurysm. So if you've got a disease, let's say, let's say you've got um, the thoracic aorta, right? And this is an aneurysm right here and it's bulging. And you've got sort of, you know, three vessels that come up and feed the neck and head. And here's where the heart, this is where the heart is, right? And so if you're going to build a stent and you're gonna to try to bypass the, 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 the fluid flow, you would have the stent here and you would do this, but if it was a wide open, open mesh, then you would still perfuse the aneurysm sac. And so we cover them and they're called stent grafts or covered stents. Make sense? You put a fabric, you use a Dacron, you use PTFD, and this is what I used to do for gore. So I designed a thoracic um, endograph for gore and, and we sold it. Okay, that's why I drew it so fast. And that's why I could draw it because I've drawn it like a million times. It's the only thing I can draw. Um, so that's a stent graph. So these are the standard of care today. No more open surgical repair. You just go in through a vessel, okay? And you'll see a lot of these procedures like advertised, like endovascular repair or minimally invasive surgery. And they show like a little Band-Aid on the, on the thigh. I mean, it, it's a little bit more of an incision than that. I mean, you're accessing the femoral artery, which is actually a pretty big deal. And I've seen some cases gone really bad where the catheter doesn't go in correctly or doesn't come out correctly. And you're, you know, you're seeing blood pouring out of the femoral artery. So it, it's not always perfect, but when things go well, which is most of the time, like probably high 90% success rate, you've got a really great procedure. So that's how we do this today. If you're up in the neck, right, you're probably gonna use either a stent like this or a stent graft depending upon the trauma. If there's a aneurysm, you need a stent graft. If it's just, it's narrow, you might get away with a stent or maybe a drug-coated stent. Understood? Yeah, especially here. Question is, is there a risk of vascular rupture? Well, the reason that this aneurysm down, it's like an old garden hose that's pretty cracked and frayed and left out in the sun. And, and then you connect it to the hose bin and you turn it on and you know it's got a little nozzle thingy on the end and, and so now it bulges. Well, there's a weak spot here. So you don't want to put too much pressure here. And, and so, well, it, is, is this portion weak? I don't know. Is, is this portion weak? I don't know, right? So, so the, the standard of care is, at least in the aorta, is you usually use two centimeters of healthy neck is where you land your device. That's what, that's what we always have taught physicians. Is it now also in line with like the plaque forming, since it's expanding like the, uh, the walls of that artery so much, that do they give a lot of like alcohol? Yeah, so also with here, if you've got a really inflate, and there are inflation guidelines that they'll say don't inflate beyond X PSI uh, okay. based on the size of the blood vessel. And there's a safety margin there so that you, what you don't want to do is you don't want to rupture that plaque and then you cause right, a hemorrhage. Right? Yeah. Really?
really good question. You, you'll learn all this in, in med school. Right? When you fail like 20 times, you'll get it right, and then you don't know what to do. That's why they call it the practice of medicine. You're just trying until you get it right. Yeah? How does it stay in place? How does it stay in place? It's a great question. So there's two different strategies. There's called active fixation or <coughs> passive fixation. So if you inflate it and you oversize this from the nominal diameter of the vessel, you're going to have you know some some oversizing pressure, and that's called passive fixation. Personally, I think that's the best. There are companies that actually put barbs and hooks on the ends of their device to penetrate and anchor into the vessel wall. That's called active fixation, but you can imagine it does do trauma to the vessel wall. I don't think biologically that's a good idea. But they can get a patent on it, and they can keep other people from doing it, and so there's probably business reasons that they go that way. You're like, what? A lot of these decisions are based on business, not on clinical practice. Yes, most of them are based on business decisions, not on clinical practice. And as a physician, guess what? You're using the stuff that companies make. So you get to choose amongst a population of technology <coughs> that business people decided upon. Make sense? That's how it works. Sorry to be the realist, but that's how it works. Any other questions? So this is the standard of care. This is what we're doing today. Um, <clears throat> moving away from how to prevent a stroke. That's, that's all about how to prevent a stroke if you're up in the neck, right? And then I drew this because this is down below the neck, obviously, but similar principles. And we'll talk more about this kind of stuff when we get to the cardiovascular section. So you can see neurovascular is hard to segregate out of neurological disease or cardiovascular disease. And actually, in reality, it's got its own category. Neurovascular diseases, really, if you can do a whole class on neurovascular diseases. Okay, and you can do a whole class on, on thoracic um, or, or uh, aortic uh, diseases, whether it's thoracic or abdominal. You can do a whole class from here to here. Below the neck, ignoring carotids, and just doing the thoracic aorta all the way down to the femoral bifurcation. You, you can do a whole semester on that. All right, let's switch gears a little bit to um, brain trauma. So acute brain trauma, um, this is an insult uh, to the brain. And this change that is instituted usually includes psychological changes, physical, emotional, intellectual. Um, and because the patient is actually experiencing a traumatic uh, insult to brain tissue. <coughs> now, there's two types. There could be um, blunt force trauma where the the cranial cap remains intact. That's what blunt force trauma would be. So a lot of automobile accidents or somebody, you know, gets struck on the back of the head, but there's no actual fracture of the cranial cap. And then open trauma would be, obviously, you've got the cranial bones are compromised, and now you've got physical trauma to the open part of the brain. <clears throat> then we've got different types of injury that are referred to as coup versus contra coup. So a, uh, a coup injury occurs to the front part of the brain um, when the brain is struck. Contra coup refers to the opposite side of the brain that's struck because there's a recoil. So if, if there's trauma to here, the, the brain is actually gonna move forward. Remember, it's floating in fluid. So if you strike the back of the head, you'll have a coup injury at the location of the strike, but you actually might have frontal lobe trauma or contra coup in, uh, injury because the brain actually kind of pivots forward and smacks the front part of the brain. Make sense? So coup is where the strike is, and contra coup is the opposite portion of where the strike actually occurs. So would that be like a well, so we're going to get into that. Yeah, so we're, so it could be a concussion, it could be a contusion, we could have a hemorrhage, right? We could have a hematoma. There's like four different things. Most likely, it'll be a concussion. 
it may be worse than that. So we're gonna, we're gonna talk about that. And then if you do it repetitively, like why would you do that? Well, we'll talk about that. That's a good question, right? But we'll talk about repetitive head injury here. Okay, those are some of the slides that I added. Um, okay, let's talk about uh, this case study. This is a real case study from one of your former colleagues at the medical examiner's office. Uh, pathology student that uh, did a, a bio 408 um, field work. We do this sometimes after you take this class, you can go on, do field work. Uh, you can do it in, in conjunction with this class. Uh, so you're, it's kind of cool, you're taking this class or you took this class and now you work in the coroner's office and then you do bio 408 field work, okay? So this is a, a student that reported this back to me. Um, so. This was a 20-year-old Caucasian female tourist. It was on unprescribed Zoloft. So Zoloft is a um, antidepressant. Uh, she was actually taking her boyfriend's Zoloft because it made her feel better. She was kind of self-diagnosed as being slightly depressed, so she was borrowing her boyfriend's um, antidepressant. We'll talk about more on that. Uh, presents as dizzy, fell on the back of her head. She expired on the way to the emergency department. It was a possible pre-death seizure activity, and the question arose. As to the cause of death, was it brain trauma or was it seizure? Okay, so a couple things that you need. This is real, this is right here in Flagstaff. This came to the emergency, <laughs> emergency department and this was on the way back up from 89A down to Oak Creek Canyon. You guys know that kind of real cool uh, winding scenic route. So they were uh, tourists, they were um, uh, international tourists, so they weren't uh, American tourists, and, um, and and so she was borrowing her, her boyfriend's medication. Likely it was the wrong dose, okay? She was probably too small compared to uh, the mass of her boyfriend, and so her prescription should have been different. But anyways, um, so that's one lesson of you know, why we don't let people borrow medication. That's a bad idea, because you never know what's going to happen. So the... Um, Autopsy revealed, oh, let me, let me this forward. Autopsy revealed significant occipital lobe trauma, possible hemorrhage, and induced hematoma, a contracrude trauma, contra trauma to the frontal lobe. Uh, cause of death determined to be brain trauma induced death. Okay, so, likely what took place is she, she fell, right, and she hit her head. And, and as she hit her head, the brain moved and hit the other side of the head. So, so or the, the cranial cap. So the question that the boyfriend couldn't um, answer is how did she fall? Did she fall and strike the front of her head and then the brain kind of essentially bounced off the pavement and struck the occipital lobe? Or did she strike the occipital lobe and, and, and then the brain bounced up and hit the frontal lobe? And because of the significant trauma and autopsy of the occipital lobe first, they believe that was the first strike. And she fell backwards, but there was significant laceration to uh, the, the frontal lobe as well. So this is a coup contra coup example that happened unfortunately right here in Coconino County. Um, and one of your former colleagues uh, was involved in that autopsy. And, and you know, it, it sounds kind of weird, but she was kind of excited to share the story with me. She was like, oh gosh, this would be, this would be great for your class. And, so I asked permission if I could actually use it just to give you guys a real world example. Yeah. yeah. So is Kui normally uh, like the worst injury of the two and Contra Kui is kind of like more of a secondary injury? Typically, yeah. yeah. Typically. Okay. Let's talk about diffuse versus focal brain injury. So diffuse refers to diffuse axonal injury or DAI. Um, this could occur in the absence of blunt force trauma, usually involves acceleration, acceleration forces. So what does that mean? Well, if there's a lot of motion or ringing motion, these neurons that have these long axons, you can see the panel of images as you move from the middle to your right, you get a twisty motion on the axon, and that can actually shear the axon and cause neuronal death. Okay, so this happens diffusely, like broadly all over the brain. So, it's controversial, but an example at times, 
although it's in more of the rare occurrence if you look at the literature, is uh, shaken baby syndrome. So infants are comfortable to present with, with complications or dead, death, and it's determined that they've got diffuse axonal injury based upon shearing of neurons that, again, they're suspended in glial tissue, but if you get a lot of rotational motion, you can cause traumatic shearing forces on, on the axon portion of the neuron. Okay? So not 10 out of 10 cases of shaken baby syndrome have diffuse axonal injury, um, but there is a percentage. It's, it's a small percentage. It's like 10 to 20 percent of those cases. But that's an example of how it could occur. You guys with me? Okay. Focal, so that's diffuse. That's broadly all over the brain. Focal are uh, grossly observed. This is where the comic came, and that's where we're going, is concussions, um, contusions, hematomas, and hemorrhages. And these injuries that we're going to unfold here, um, we'll come back to concussion in a, in a more repetitive chronic nature, which is known as cr uh, chronic traumatic encephalopathy, or CTE. So we'll talk about that at the very end of the lecture today. But right now we're just gonna classically refer to concussion, contusion, hematoma, and hemorrhage. So what is a concussion? So a concussion is defined as reversible altered consciousness. Okay, so reversible. So everyone's like, oh, phew, it's reversible. Yeah, it is, but they can be pretty severe, okay? They can, they can be pretty severe. Um, there's no contusion. What, what does that mean? There's no actual physical damage to the parenchymal tissue of the brain, which is good. Uh, typically, there's amnesia, where, where that individual will have large periods of time that they don't even remember. They don't recall events. So for example, they, they don't remember playing in any of the game where they got the concussion. Even if the concussion happened in the last three minutes of the fourth quarter, they, they don't remember any of it, okay? Uh, they could actually have such amnesia that they walked off the field themselves, waved to the crowd, right? Thumbs up, I'm good. And all their teammates say, hey, what's the film? You were like saying you were fine. Yeah, I, I don't remember that. So yeah, a, there's no contusion and it's reversible, but this is pretty serious, right? The brain has been smacked, it's pretty hard. Um, we don't know, we don't understand how this works. Clearly, you're traumatizing the neurons. Likely, theoretically, and this is all hypothetical, you've completely disrupted action potential capabilities, okay? But obviously, in the short-term memory space of the brain, you've, you've completely lost all of that data. So it never made it into short-term memory. But usually with am amnesia, uh, it is short-term memory only. Like they'll remember their name, they'll remember who people are, typically. Now, as it gets more aggressive or multiple concussions, they might start stop remembering those things. Like the coach walks in and they say, well, who are you? Well, that's usually a sign there's been multiple concussions or a history of concussions. So we'll talk a little bit more about that when we talk about CTE. Um, so you can kind of see in children, um, you can see kind of the, you know, the breakdown uh, fall, 44 and a half percent. So my, my niece and my brother are visiting this week and, um, and, and it's been a while since my kids were, my niece is age, she's, she's uh, four. But um, I think in about five days, she, she, I, I, I stopped counting and I got to like 57 falls in like five days. Um, I mean, I'm not, I'm not exaggerating. She just runs around and you know, she's down, right? I mean, if you watch these little kids play and you and I did that, even as young and as athletic as you all are, I mean, you'd be sore by the end of the day. The amount of times the kids fall is unbelievable. So the, the chances of hitting their head are pretty high. 44 and a half percent concussions by, by fall. Uh, collision, struck by an object, struck by a person. So you can kind of see um, the breakdown, different ways that this can happen. A contusion, so what's a, what's a contusion? So if you look on uh, the lower right, uh, just above that number 33, uh, on the lower right, you can actually appreciate where 
the trauma is, or the damage, the contusion, the laceration uh, to, to, to the brain. So here is where you've got trauma to the brain. And this is obviously post mortem. So you've got bruising, you've got necrosis. This would be what kind of necrosis? Liquefaction, very good, okay. Um, and this is not reversible. In fact, obviously in this case, it was lethal. Now, what about a uh, hematoma? Now, in a hematoma, you have a collection of blood or an accumulation of blood that takes place. So the reason for that is there's been a laceration or there's been physical damage to the brain and you've severed a vessel in the nervous tissue and now it's leaking. And so now you've got bruising. That's all that's all a bruise is. If you I mean you probably got bruises on your arm, you know, it's gonna turn different colors. And a lot of that's because of the iron considering uh, that's why you get really cool colors of bruises. Um, but I know it's kind of a nerdy thing to say, but uh, some of them are really quite spectacular, you know, yellows and you know, purple. But um, in the brain, when you have bruising, you know, so that's a hematoma. So that's the tr correct terminology. You've got uh, extravasation of blood, meaning it leaves the vascular <coughs> tube. Okay, so that's what happens with a bruise. So you're getting bruising that's taking place and you're getting blood pooling and then it coagulates in the brain. The problem in the brain is, remember, we've got a cranial cap that has a confined space. So if you're leaking blood and you have pooling of blood, you, you're increasing pressure on the brain because it doesn't have anywhere to go, okay? Three types. Um, we've got epidural, subdural, dural, and subarachnoid. Uh, subarachnoid is typically seen with the contusion, and then let's compare and contrast the epidural and the subdural, this upper right slide. So in the upper right slide, you've got epidural on the left portion of this image, and then you've got subdural on the right portion. So the epidural is typically an arterial bleed, right? And it's in the epidural space uh, because of where the tearing of the dura is located. And so with these epidural and subdural, those meningeal layers that are well vascularized kind of tear away. And depending upon how they tear, you're gonna have an epidural bleed, which is arterial blood, or you'll have a subdural bleed, which is venous blood. Um, there's an example here of an intracerebral hemorrhage where, hemorrhage, where it's bleeding inside of the brain. And then here's our subarachnoid hemorrhage, which is in the subarachnoid space. Um, and that is very commonly associated with um, a contusion where you've got trauma. So if you see the, the, the gross image or the large image, you can use the word gross here in both meanings, right? Disgusting as well as large. Um, now cerebral hemorrhage. So a cerebral hemorrhage is an active bleed. Um, you, you don't yet have the pooling of blood, it's actively bleeding. That's the difference between hemorrhage and hematoma. Is the hemorrhage is actively bleeding and eventually is gonna turn into a hematoma when it stops bleeding. But these cerebral hemorrhages, these vessel ruptures, there, there are sort of a number of different reasons that they can occur. And trauma with contusion is one of them. But you'll see cerebral bleeds or cerebral hemorrhages usually uh, another name for a cerebral uh, hemorrhage is a brain bleed. So, so uh, you got a car accident, they're really worried, uh, they're, they're, they're alert, they're back, but they're in a lot of pain and they're worried about the brain bleed. Like, what, what are they talking, that's what they're talking about. There's an active bleed somewhere and it will turn into a hematoma and they don't think, so there might, there's lot, likely there is vessel rupture. We don't know how much trauma to the parenchymal tissue has been done. So a brain bleed is another word for a cerebral hemorrhage. So the other things that can cause a cerebral hemorrhage, high blood pressure, hypertension, that's what that is. You've got these AV malformations or <coughs> arterial venous malformations. These are genetic defects that we all have, okay, in some, some way, shape, or form. 
So where the arterial side meets the venous side, there's some sort of malformation and there's a weak point in the wall, and so you get a little bit of an aneurysm. And when you get these aneurysms, a lot of times they're saccular, kind of like I drew right here in the aorta. Here's the circle of Willis, drawn much better than my horrible picture the other day. Uh, and you can kind of appreciate um, at the anterior communicating artery um, up here, this is most of where these aneurysms, these saccular aneurysms take place. There, there's two types of aneurysms, saccular, and it looks like a little sac, and then the other type of aneurysm is called a fusiform, where it kind of balloons out circumferentially. So this would be a fusiform aneurysm. They're, they're a lot more rare than the saccular. The saccular are a little bit more common, a lot more common. Uh, and then trauma contusion. Often we get a hematoma, which is what you're seeing right here. This is up top, this is a hematoma, because it's after the brain bleed or the cerebral hemorrhage has stopped, and, and now the blood's coagulated. Down in this lower picture, this is showing this anterior communicating artery, this white arrow is actually pointing to a saccular aneurysm, a real saccular aneurysm in that picture. So you guys can appreciate what they truly look like. Some more pictures on the saccular aneurysm side of things. So this is that picture that we just looked at. Uh, here's another um, example at explant histologically. Uh, so this huge blowout, this is this one side of the vessel, here's the other side of the vessel, and this is the aneurysm, okay? So super thin, completely capable of, of rupturing out. Here's another one right here histologically. So this is one side of the vessel, this is the other side of the vessel, and this saccular aneurysm is, is bulging out this direction. Okay, you can see a little bit of clotted blood up top that's what this little remnant is histologically. Okay, so different types of saccular aneurysms. Questions? Okay, let's, in the last segment, we're gonna talk about a couple of, um, of really interesting uh, nervous system disorders. I mean, most of what we're talking about before here are, are gonna be, um, they're, they're diseases, but um, you know, there, a lot of times they're associated with you know, um, trauma or an insult, uh, or they're associated with you know, um, not a lot of exercise, poor diet over a long period of time. Right? Now we're gonna move into some stuff where um, these unfortunately are things that you know, uh, aren't necessarily avoidable in some patient populations. Right? Because you either get infected with it, like with meningitis, uh, or in other cases, you have a genetic predisposition to it. Okay, I mean you, you can't you can't necessarily predict if you're going to have a concussion. Okay, uh, and, and, and you can't necessarily predict, although you know now we would argue that whether or not you're going to have a, a saccular aneurysm. Right. Well, if you have high blood pressure, you eat you know fried chicken every night, and you never exercise. Well, those, yeah, yeah, you might get the piece. But if you're in the wrong place at the, at the right time, you might just contract meningitis. And some of the other diseases we're gonna talk about, um, we're, still, we're still scratching our head why some people get them and, and other people don't. Okay, so we'll, we'll, we'll explain that here in a minute. So meningitis, this is an infection of the leptomeninges. And this layer of the leptomeninges is this combined space that's occupied by the arachnoid mater and the pia mater. The causal agents can be bacterial, they can be fungal, or they can be viral. And it's critically important that we learn very quickly which one of them they are. Symptoms occur because the treatments are different. If it's a bacterial infection, you don't treat with an antiviral. If it's a viral infection, you don't treat with an antibiotic, okay? And if it's a fungal, you need an antifungal. Um, symptoms, headache. Uh, photophobia, like sensitivity to light, really bothers these patients. Stiff neck, irritability, irritability. They, they have almost like flu-like symptoms, like they're feeling kind of achy. You know that horrible achy feeling you get when you have the flu? Okay, that, that's that's kind of what a lot of these patients will, will complain of. 
If they do a lumbar puncture, they pull that fluid out, cerebral spinal fluid, so they have to do a spinal tap in order to get that. Um, they'll see leukocytosis, they'll see dead white blood cells. Uh, they'll see elevated protein content because that barrier, the blood-brain barrier, has been compromised. That's likely how the infection got into the brain. So now big proteins can make it in. Um, and they see a decrease in glucose. The brain's using up the fluid, and typically the bacteria is using up the sugar as well. Bacteria like sugar. Um, in your age group, college-age students are most frequently, frequently infected with the Neisseria meningitis, that bottom one on that list. Whereas the Streptococcus pneumonia is tends to be targeting the young and the very elderly. Okay, so if we've got uh, dorm rooms or we've got military barracks, that's usually a, a, a young, healthy population, not infant or toddler, but your age group, okay? Um, and so that would be Neisseria. And then our infants and our elderly tend to have problems with streptococcal infections. This picture is showing um, uh, pyogenic meningitis. So there's a superlative exudate. That's that white, foamy substance that's kind of oozing out of the bottom of the brain, so the brain stem. Obviously, this is a head plan. This can be lethal if it's not treated. And if it's treated quickly, it's really not a big deal. All right, let's talk about, yes, sir. Yeah, of course. <coughs> so creutzfeldt jakob disease, right? creutzfeldt jakob CJD, um, this is a disease of brain tissue that is rather rare, but it's gotten a lot of publicity in, in recent years, um, and so I want to characterize it. So it's a prion disease. So prions, what are they? Well, well prions are a, a portion of proteins, and they're normal cellular proteins. Um, these Cellular proteins, there's proteins that are inside of the cell that normally are there, known as prions, and, but they can actually mutate. And so the normal proteins that you see on this slide in the upper right, these normal cellular proteins, these prions, are called PRPC, kind of in the sort of brownish boxes. And then you've got the opportunity for a spontaneous conformational change of the protein. A protein has a three-dimensional shape, and if it moves its shape around and undergoes a conformational change, it can actually cause different things to occur. It binds differently, okay? It may have different antigen binding sites, right? It may fold in a unique way, so it interacts with other proteins in different ways. And so when a mutated form uh, sees the normal form, it may actually convert it to the mutated form, and now you start getting two mutated proteins that are interacting with each other. And as they form these aggregates, they form these lesions in the parenchymal tissue of the brain. So, for this event to occur, um, in the patient population, sporadically, or, or just without really any influence, is about one case per million. So it's very rare. However, the problem is this mutation can transfer from mammalian organism to mammalian organism. And so there's a similar disease in the bovine population or the cow population. And this is a disease known as bovine spongiform encephalopathy, or what we refer to as mad cow disease. Okay, and so these mutations are taking place in a cow population. You're like, well, how does it get to humans? Well, this is pretty disgusting, but I'm gonna explain it to you, okay? If you're gonna have hamburgers for dinner, you may choose otherwise, okay? Um, the practices 
for, for processing beef aren't exactly perfect. And so an often, oftentimes, if there is cattle that's infected with bovine spongiform encephalopathy or bad cow disease, it is isolated to the protein prions in the nervous tissue in the central nervous system. And they're getting these aggregates that are forming. And as the aggregate form, you can kind of see this is a positive stain. The brown stain is for the mutated, oh, sorry, the green one, the mutated prion in this neural tissue. And as this moves forward, it starts reorganizing the brain tissue to have all these holes or these vacuoles. And here's, a, here's an inset with a large blow up of one of those vacuoles, an open space. And so it has this appearance of a sponge. And so it's called mad cow disease or spongy form encephalopathy because of the clinical histology in our cow population. Well, so you said it's just in the brain, right? And the beef comes from the muscle, correct? But in the slaughterhouses, a lot of times they'll bring the cattle in and in order to terminate their life quickly, Right? They'll actually have a device that comes in and punches through the head, okay, and terminates their life instantaneously. Well, if there's mutated prions there and they contaminate other utensils, right, that are used to collect beef, now you've got contamination in your beef. You with me? Here's another piece of information is a lot of the leftover material that is not graded for human consumption gets processed back into the cattle's feed. And so, yeah, it's a form of animalism for cattle, right? But that's part of the feed. And so th these, these practices have been uncovered. Um, and, and it's not as big of a problem, it's really not as, not a problem, it's never really been a problem at all in the United States, believe it or not. I don't think we've ever had a clinical situation in the US of bovine spongy form encephalitis. It does happen outside of the US, okay? And, and it's happened pretty aggressively in Brazil, in Australia, and in the UK, up in England. Um, in fact, I remember I was traveling, and I was in England once when there was a mad cow break, outbreak, and um, um, we had all these crazy cattle like, what, running around, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> but we weren't allowed, to, we weren't supposed to eat anything that had beef. And in England, there's not a whole lot to choose from from, from a cuisine standpoint. I'm assuming that it's not, they're not known for that. You know, France is a different story. Okay. Uh, so there wasn't a whole lot. So I ate a lot of like bangers and mash, right? Like sausage and potatoes. That's what I had a lot of because there wasn't really any other choices. Okay. Um, so that's how this takes place. You get these um, progression of rapid dementia, not just in cattle, but in humans. Um, cell injury that takes place is you get these huge vacuoles because you're losing neurons um, to this Creutzfeldt Jakob disease. Okay. All right, next up, multiple sclerosis, MS. So we talked about MS as a type four hypersensitivity, right? Type four hypersensitivity due to the role of CDA positive T cells. We've got cytotoxic T cells. Um, it is more likely to occur in women than it is in men, usually in childbearing years, right? So premenopausal, like post-adolescence, premenopausal. Um, about one per 1,000 people in the U.S. are affected. The plaques that form tend to form on portions of the brain and the spi spinal cord where the myelin, uh, the myelin, the myelin is broken down and you've got um, an abundance of macrophages that are attacking the myelin sheath. Um, the oligodendrocytes, remember, they're the glial cell that's responsible in the central nervous system for manufacturing myelin. So the oligodendrocytes start developing plaque lesions around them. And you start getting this, um, plaque that forms, or a scar is another name for it. Scar or fibrotic lesion is taking place. So you kind of see in this picture the 
extent or the thickening of this white tissue, um, but most notably, this red tissue is this plaque or this scar that's forming uh, on the lateral horn in this particular image. And so you can see from a CNS standpoint, as well as from a periphery, we actually have the involvement of both CDA positive T cells as well as CD4 positive T cells. And remember, the CD4 positive T cells are instrumental because we call them this linchpin cell, meaning they kind of do everything. They're a helper T cell, meaning they help all these different processes. So they're gonna help um, macrophages be recruited. They're gonna help um, plasma cells or B cells manufacture antibodies. So in MS, are there, ident are there identifiable antibodies associated with it? Yes. Why is it type four hypersensitivity? Because of the involvement of the T cells, okay? So I don't want you to miss that in the future that, oh, well, it was a type four hypersensitivity, but it was just T cell activity. No, it means that T cell activity is involved. It doesn't mean that there aren't any autoantibodies in the cell. Whereas one, two, and three, you really don't have T cell involvement, you just have the antibodies, okay? Um, Etiology, environmental versus uh, genetics. So, you know, clearly there's a role of genetics and we don't understand why um, certain individuals are very susceptible to developing MS and others are not. Um, we have seen epidemiologically in studies that um, there are certain races that are more susceptible to developing MS. Um, these tend to be races that are more that are further from the equator. So the more Nordic um, the ethnicity or the lineage of the genetics, the more susceptible they tend to be to developing MS. Uh, so African tribes that are near the equator, not a lot of MS in that population, okay? Um, that has also led to some theories uh, on is there some environmental component, meaning further from the equator like sunlight versus not enough sunlight. You know, having not enough sunlight, is that a, is that a genetic, or is that an environmental trigger? Uh, and so these are controversial topics, um, but just so you, if, if you dive out into the literature, you'll see that there is discussion about certain ethnicities, that's the genetic component, and then there's discussion about, well, is there an environmental trigger um, being lack of sunlight? Okay, next up. Did you guys all get a chance to preview this, this um, <coughs> little documentary? Just take that as a no. All right, we're gonna show it. Maybe not. Oh, it's muted here. So that first, you, you can watch this on your own. You can you know, put your pods in and turn it all the way up. I don't know why it's just quiet on this particular. I got everything all the way up. Um, so that was a Supreme Court justice. And if you can hear his diction, he's sharp as a tack. He doesn't sound like an old man, okay? And he's in his 80s. And then here's a patient that's got Alzheimer's. And you're gonna, you're gonna see him get interviewed just briefly by a psychologist, and he's gonna wrestle with certain word choices, okay? Yeah? I put the folks out in the chat. Oh, there we go. That was smart, thank
Okay, so this this is a, a video that's like 12 minutes long. We're not going to watch the whole thing. I just wanted to compare and contrast two 80 year old men. Okay, um, and and the reason for that is it, not not to go into too much of the difficult story about Alzheimer's, but enough for you to understand that there are certain individuals that genetically are predisposition for this, and. Alzheimer's itself is considered to be a disease of the aged, okay? Um, you know, sometimes people refer to it as Alzheimer's disease, right, or old timer's disease. And it, and it does affect people that are older in age versus people that are younger in age. It's a dementia. It's in the category of dementias. It's not the only one. It's one of the most common dementias. And in this disease, the problem are these beta amyloid plaques that form. These plaques that take place and show up in the tissue create these lesions in the parenchymal tissue of the brain. Now you've compromised or prevented certain types of neuronal signals fire. So it takes place over time, most likely. But you can see in the images on the upper right that we've got this opportunity for different portions of the amyloid protein to aggregate. So we can either have the amyloid protein, which is a transmembrane protein. We've got the domain, this amyloid precursor, which is the soluble fragment. This can cleave off and form these amyloid fibrils, or we can get the uh, alpha beta unit, the peptide that's inserted into the membrane, to fragment off and form these uh, alpha beta aggregates. And in either circumstance, you're gonna get these variations of plaque lesions. So on the, on, on the left are these amyloid fibers, and then here we're seeing these beta amyloid AB fragment plaques that take place. But in all three of these panels, what we have is we've got scar or plaque lesions that are forming that are preventing normal neuronal output or flow from taking place. So you've replaced functional parenchymal tissue of the brain with a scarred portion of tissue. Usually it, it appears um, as an impairment of some higher order brain functions, okay? Um, typically memory is very common. Um, patients will, will forget names of common things, like, like the heart, as you saw in the, in, in the video. The video is tough to watch, and, and I'm not saying you have to watch all of it, I just wanna show a little segment, but I know some of you have family members that, that this is something that you've wrestled with, so it can bring up really rough, rough memories. So maybe don't watch the rest of the video. It was just to try to compare and contrast two 80-year-old gentlemen. But you'll see more of the interview with Hugh, and, and it's, it's tough to watch. Now what you'll see in the video is he has a twin brother. He has a twin brother that is not affected by, by Alzheimer's, or at least not yet affected by Alzheimer's. But, so, and they're identical twins, so you're like, well, wait a second. So is it a genetic predisposition that you said? How do you explain that? Well, that's why it's such an interesting video. We still don't know. We don't know why this takes place or how it takes place. So there are some risk factors, however, associated with Alzheimer's. And so I want to walk through the list. Age is the number one risk factor. The older the patient, the more susceptible they are to developing Alzheimer's. Prior head trauma. Prior head trauma. So multiple concussions, for example you're increasing your risk of developing Alzheimer's later in life. Um, believe it or not, unfortunately, females tend to be at higher risk than males. Um, and this is an interesting one that's in the books, um, low education. And I wanna explain this in a second, uh, for a second. So Alzheimer's impairs higher order brain function. And so individuals that are very well educated tend to be able to mask the symptoms of Alzheimer's better. Because you'll watch this with Hugh. He, he's a clever he's a clever old guy. 
He's kind of cute. And he kind of plays with the psychologist as he's getting the interview. And he almost starts, you know, you know, I think there's a portion where he's like, well, I know what it is. You tell me what it is. Let's see if we have the same answer, right? Because he doesn't remember what it is. You're like, wow, well, he can't be losing his mind. I mean, he's sharp as a tack. He's, he's joking around like that. Right? So, so higher level education is able to kind of hide, I think, the symptoms better than those that maybe not have as much education. Uh, so that that's the explanation of why you would see low education as, as an example there of uh, a risk factor. Okay, so Parkinson's disease. Uh, so Parkinson's disease, uh, that, that's uh, me and Muhammad Ali, um, um, you know, squaring off right there. His fist is about two times the size of my head in that picture. Probably is in real life, actually. Um, but um, Parkinson's disease is a disease of the substantial nigra. This is part of the midbrain, part of the basal ganglia, and the dopamine-related transmitters are being affected. And in Parkinson's disease, these patients um, have a decreased ability to produce this dopamine. And you can see the pigmentation in the basal ganglia on this slide, where we've got the normal pigmentation of the basal ganglia indicating high levels of dopamine production. And in a depigmented Parkinson's patient, lack of production of <laughs> dopamine. And, and so why is, is dopamine so important? Normally, it stimulates the substantial nigra, and dopamine when it stimulates the substantial nigra, it inhibits unwanted movements. And so nigra movements are nice and smooth. And in Parkinson's patients, there's, there's an underlying tremor. If you watched any videos of Muhammad Ali uh, later in his life, he died in 2016, so just about three years ago. That's the same year that my mother died. And, and that's the reason that I was at the uh, Barrow Neurological Institute. Uh, that was the same year that Muhammad Ali died. My, my mom was there. And so I got, I got a picture in front of the, front of the sign. He donated a ton of money to a Vero Neurological Institute to study Parkinson's disease. And there's no question that he had Parkinson's disease. There's no question at all. Um, however, and, and most of the cases of Parkinson's disease are idiopathic, I mean, we don't know the cause. But in, in um, Muhammad Ali's circumstance, we strongly believe that um, his boxing career was a trigger for developing Parkinson's disease. But it also now is becoming, is controversial to, to, to talk about. And, um, and this is because of chronic traumatic encephalopathy. So CTE. So with CTE, we've got this progressive degenerative disease of the brain. Um, that's in patients that have repetitive injury um, they're having traumatic brain injuries on, on, on a regular basis. It was first described in 1928 as a uh, punch drunk syndrome in boxers. That's what, that's, what the, that's what the name was. It was referred to as a punch drunk syndrome or dementia pug pugilistica. Um, and this was a, a physician named Dr. Harrison Martland in, the, in the 28, 1928 that first described it. It was more popularized recently um, by Dr. Bennett Amalu. Okay, and Dr. Bennett Amalu um, characterized CTE in National Football League players in the United States. Okay, this was hugely controversial, and this CTE um, that was described by uh, uh, Dr. Amalu, there's a link here, and I'm gonna let you watch this because this link goes to this movie called Concussion. We don't have time to watch this today, but this is a great movie with Will Smith. So if you like Aladdin, you guys like Aladdin? You're gonna love Concussion. They're not even remotely related. Okay? <laughs> but Will Smith's in both of them, okay? And so what I want you guys to see in this video, stay with me one second, I know we're a little late getting started, is the difference between 
chronic injury to the brain, to the question that was asked earlier about concussions. Yeah, but if they're repetitive concussions, chronically over time, look at the difference, okay, post-mortem and the size of the brain. Normal brain on your left, and over here on your right, we've got a CTE brain. These pictures are uploaded, the link to concussion trailer is there. I think you guys should watch it, I think you'll find it entertaining, especially knowing what you know now, okay? All right, you guys have a great weekend.